Joining me now in studio is Joel Pollack, political commentator and senior editor at large at Breitbart News, also author of the ebook Wacko Birds: The Fall and Rise of the Tea Party. Thanks for coming back, Joel. Good to be with you. All right, Obama said North Korea was responsible for the hack attack on uh, Sony. Now there's some question about whether that's true, and now we've imposed sanctions. What do you make of that whole rigmarole? I think the sanctions part of it is probably less significant because the individuals named in the sanctions are just going to be replaced by other people. They're not that sweeping, and we don't do that much trade with North Korea anyway. A lot of what they do is already subject to international sanction. The real question is if there's a discrepancy between what the Obama administration says happened and what actually happened, because they really went out there and said this was the North Koreans. And if they're wrong about that, if it was an inside job, if it was a disgruntled employee or something like that, then we have real questions about our security networks. We have questions about our intelligence. And those need to be addressed urgently because these kinds of cyber attacks are happening all the time that do come from foreign sources, from China, for example, as well as internal espionage. We've, we've got to get that straight. And if that's a problem, we have something to worry about. Will we find out? I think we will. I think there's going to be some further investigation of these employees. It, it's, by the way, they're not mutually exclusive. It could be that an employee inside Sony fed information to a foreign intelligence agency. But I think we will eventually get to the bottom of it. How vulnerable are we? I think we're incredibly vulnerable. And, you know, the federal government is recruiting actively for hackers. Uh, there was a news item this morning about it. And they're looking for people who have these kinds of skills who can fend off foreign attacks as well as perhaps carry out some foreign attacks in retaliation. This is a real problem, and I don't think we've devoted enough attention to it under Republican and Democratic administrations. We've got real vulnerabilities in our national networks, and not just uh, through online mechanisms. We have vulnerabilities in our power grids, our transportation networks. All kinds of small-scale attacks could cause large-scale problems. Chris Shea has just told us he was very happy about opening up to Cuba. You think we should have embassies everywhere? There should be no such thing as non-recognition? What do you think? I'm much less optimistic about it. I think the decision was done in the wrong way, first of all. I think that the Cubans already have open trade with many other countries in the world and yet no change in that regime. I also think that the embargo was basically given away for nothing in return. We gave back these three Cuban spies. We got this hostage back. Glad he's back. But we haven't yet secured the release of the political prisoners the Castro's promised to free. We have no way of monitoring whether they're complying with that. There's no democratic reform in Cuba that they agreed to. They came out and pounded the podium and said, we're going to stay communist. It's unclear what we're really getting out of this. And the idea is, well, OK, we'll liberalize slowly if we have trade with them and so forth and cultural exchanges. We have significant cultural exchanges in trade. We're their number one trading partner right now, even with with the embargo, and it hasn't really caused reform. And as to the case we're just putting embassies in different places, we tried that with Syria, and look where Syria what is What do today. we gain by not talking? What you gain is a firm moral stand on human rights issues. And, you know, we had the same problem with the Soviet Union, Cuba's patron, back in the 70s. And we had, at least at that point in 1975, a human rights agreement which said, well, we'll continue trade and aid assistance to the Soviet Union. We'll recognize some of what they want recognized internationally, but we're going to condition all this on human rights progress. And if you talk to activists, they'll tell you that's part of what brought the Soviet system down in the end, was the insistence on those human rights conditions. We don't have that with the Cuba uh, deal. You think Israel will renew relations with Cuba? Hard to tell. You know, the Israelis have a foreign policy that is independent of our own, even if uh, they are, to some extent, very coupled to the tote, as they say in, in horse racing, uh, to the United States. Uh, Israel's relationship with Russia, for example, is very different. They have not come out and condemned the situation in Crimea in quite the way perhaps many Israelis would like to, because Israel knows Russia is a player in the Middle East, and Israel wants to keep Russia out of Syria, Russia out of helping Iran too much, and so forth. So uh, Israel does conduct a separate foreign policy, sometimes to the chagrin of the United States. And those are the kinds of differences that come up between allies. But it, it's hard to say. I, I can't see that Israel would have much of an interest in a relationship with Cuba. But I do think that there are some Israelis who will look at this in a more real politics sense and say, you know, what are the pluses or minuses of relations with this or any other country? Uh, domestically, what are your expe expectations of the new Congress? I think this is going to be a tough Congress to see much legislation passing in, even though Republicans now control both houses. 
I think you'll see the Senate and the House pass legislation and then Obama shut it down with a veto. There may be a couple of issues where you might see an override of the veto, maybe the Keystone Pipeline, maybe repealing the medical device tax and Obamacare, a couple other things. But for the most part, this is going to be the beginning of the chess game for 2016. Each side is going to move a few pawns forward. They're going to set the board and then let the major pieces come out in the election campaign. I think it's going to be about framing the debate going forward. And so I don't see a lot of movement coming. I think each side is going to define its priorities for the voters for 2016 by taking a stance on certain things. Republicans, for example, will repeal Obamacare in the House and the Senate. Obama will veto that. And then you'll start the smaller game of, well, what pieces of Obamacare do we think we can reform? Supreme Court's going to make a decision on one of those. That's massive, yes, yeah. massive decision uh, this coming June, King versus Burwell. It will deal with the subsidies that are offered on the federal exchanges. And if the challenge survives at the Supreme Court, if it, if it strikes down that part of Obamacare, the whole system could collapse and have to go right back to square one. What about immigration reform? That's a tough one, too, because Congress hasn't really used every tool at its disposal to show that it disagrees with what the president does. You know, the president many Republicans believe, in, and conservatives, and I'm one of them, believes that he's acted outside the bounds of the Constitution. In fact, the president said he couldn't act as an emperor. Uh, now he's done that sort of imperial act. But he's, he's done much less executive actions than most that are previous presidents. If you, look at, if you look at the memoranda that he's issued alongside the executive actions, he's done much more than previous presidents. So you've got to add those in as well. Memoranda don't have the same form, but they have essentially a similar function. They, they instruct the executive agencies to do certain things. And so they're not published in the Federal Register the way an executive uh, order is, but they do have a similar effect. And he's done much more of those, many more of those, than, than his predecessors. I think Congress is going to try to do a few things on immigration reform. They might try to pass a border security bill that's just a straight-out border security bill. Uh, about a year ago, Obama said he would sign something like that. Uh, I don't know if he'll do that now with the elections looming, with his legacy in the air. He might say, well, I want something that gives a path to citizenship as well. And then you'll see the two sides, once again, define the issues rather than move anything forward. Why not a path to citizenship after so many people here so many years? I think that two-thirds of the American people support a path to citizenship, but two-thirds also support border security first. So it's really about the sequencing. You have border security first and then the path to citizenship. I think many Americans would agree with the path to citizenship as long as it's the last amnesty. When Reagan signed Simpson-Mazzoli back in 1986, there were all these guarantees and so forth. None of them were ever implemented by Congress. And so you had amnesty for two to three million people, but you had more and more people coming in and no way to secure the border, no way to stop people who overstayed their visas. So Americans are basically saying, we're okay with people staying here, but we want to make sure that they, first of all, acknowledge that they broke the law. And secondly, we want to make sure it doesn't happen again. Do you see some decrease in racial tension in this country? You know, in, in an everyday way, on an everyday level, I, I do. I mean, I just don't think that race relations are as bad as our politics make them out to be, as bad as the debate in the media is. But I do think that when it comes to politics and race, I think it's worse than it's been in a long time. So I, the answer to that is I think America is actually a more tolerant society on its own, in spite of the politics, because of various things that happen culturally, socially, economically, people move around. I, I think that at an everyday level, I don't feel any tension in, in the neighborhoods I walk around in. And, people I know, friends and things like that. And I, I mix with a wide spectrum of people from the richest to the poorest across L.A. I like taking the bus to work, so you meet a lot of different people that way. Um, but I think on a political level, I think there's a deep mistrust that's developing along racial lines, and that's upsetting. I think that, that that's something where people on those levels should really be leading rather than following the rest Do of the Do you have a personal favorite among those particular people who are announced or unannounced for the Republican nomination? I can't say what my personal favorite is yet, but I think that my preference is towards governors. I think that governors have two things going for them. One is that they have the administrative experience of managing very large public institutions, which doesn't always come from senators. And the other advantage they have is they have to work with people from the other side. When you're a governor, you have to represent all the people of your state. You've got to deal with sometimes a legislator that's con legislature that's controlled so by the other party. Is that mean to a Jeb Bush? I'm not a Jeb Bush fan necessarily, but I'd prefer him over uh, some senators. I think, that, you know, again, he had a strong governing record in Florida. He represents the kind of you could almost call it the progressive policy wing of the Republican Party. So he represents a certain vision of what government should be and should do. He's going to be burdened by some of those policies, as well as some of his liberal positions on immigration. But there are many other governors who've certainly made a name for themselves over the last few years, and those are going to be names in the mix. Uh, Hillary Clinton was not a governor. She ran a big department, though, and she, was, she certainly has the background to be a president. 
You think she'd be formidable? I think she's formidable, and I, I would actually think of her as the favorite right now to win, despite the strong Republican bench that's, that's developed. I do think her record is going to be a problem for her. I think foreign policy is really going to be an issue she grapples with, because although, as you say, she ran a large department, many people have problems with the way she ran it and the results of uh, her running it. I think the Russia policy is going to be a big problem. In fact, I think that's the number one foreign policy facing the United States right now. We have uh, two European countries clashing in a land war. I mean, who thought that was possible after the Second World War? Mm -hmm. And yet, the Russian reset that Clinton was very much a part of uh, did not contribute in a positive way to resolving those tensions, to avoiding those problems. I think she's going to answer for that. There'll be questions about Benghazi as well and so forth. So I think she's going to try to distance herself over this year from Barack Obama's foreign policy positions, and Republicans are going to keep trying to push her back and say, no, you were part of those. Speaking of governors, a dear friend of mine passed away, Governor Mario Cuomo. I was very close to Mario. And I think he was a great person, political differences aside. What was your assessment? I had the opportunity to read one of his speeches uh, over the weekend. The and 1984 speech? Now, it's interesting you mentioned the 1984 speech. Everyone talks about that 1984 I speech. I was there, and he, I interviewed him right after that speech. So I went to... I uh, loved him. I, I just had my fifth wedding anniversary, and my wife got me a present, a book of speeches by William Sapphire, the late William Sapphire. Great put friend together. of mine, too. So he put together a book of speeches, and one of the speeches was by Mario Cuomo. And I opened the book thinking, well, I'm going to find this 1984 Democratic National Convention speech everyone's talking about. But when Mario Cuomo sent his favorite speech to William Sapphire, he chose a different speech. He chose a commencement address that he gave at a college in New York that same year, where instead of talking about the division between rich and poor, he talked about the common, you could call it a moral or spiritual crisis facing a rich country in general, where even the poor people are more well off than poor people in the rest of the world. And he said, we are lacking meaning in our lives. We lack substance in our lives. What do you tell kids who have grown up in this prosperous society? And his message was, stick to faith, stick to the lesson of the great philosophers, and above all, stick to giving to others. Ask what you can give to others. It was a transcendent moment. It was a unifying speech rather than one that divided Americans, which I think was more the message of 1984, that, uh, the convention speech. The convention speech was a kind of well, defiant speech. Well, speaker has to be defiant, but it was a right. great defiant speech. It was a defiant speech, but the speech he chose himself was one of unity, and I, I really enjoyed delving into that speech. Thanks, Joel. Joel Pollack. His e-book is Wacko Birds, The Fall and Rise of the Tea Party. And again, my thoughts go with the family of Governor Mario Cuomo, Matilda, and the wonderful kids. My best to all of them and my, my deep condolences. Thanks for joining me on this edition of Politicking. Remember, I want to hear from you. You can join the conversation on my Facebook page. Share your thoughts with me on Twitter by tweeting at King's Things and use the Politicking hashtag. And that's all for this week's Politicking.